Hey YouTube, welcome back to our channel. My name is Elena. And I'm Bjorn. And this is Vikings React, where we take a look at some of your favorite Viking TV shows and discuss their historical accuracies. We're jumping right back into Norsemen again. Uh, today we're going to be talking about horned helmets. We're going to talk about cultural perception and a blood eagle. Are we? Freya? What are those? The Vikings did not have horn helmets. Horns happen to be the latest fashion. The idea that Vikings had horns in their helmets is part of a romanticized notion that came about in about like 1870s with um, Wagner's Ring Cycle, massive opera um, that is widely famous for good reason. It's amazing. It's not really based on any kind of solid grounding that we know of to, to say that Vikings had horns in their helmets or decorated themselves as such. Um, it's just artistic license that he happened to take and it became massively popular during that era. So we see a lot of um, you know romantic Viking pictures and paintings um, all with this kind of uh, symbolism involved with it. The helmet is a basic head cover, right? Yeah, yeah. But when you add some other material like horns, it becomes something else. It's no longer just a helmet. It is something bigger, it tells a story, and that is what fashion is all about. There are examples that we have of actual you know, grave finds and um, archaeological discoveries that have horns or horn-like implements on helmets. Um, there's just nothing from the Viking Age. So to speak on the few examples of these horns that we do have, uh, one of the main ones that I can think of is from Waterloo, which is a find in Thames in England from, I believe, like a 150 to 50 BC. Um, it's basically just a, a helmet with these massive cones on it that are reminiscent of horns. Another find that comes to mind is one from Vexa in um, Zealand, Denmark. Um, and this one has more stylized horns, dates from uh, the Bronze Age, which is about like a thousand BC, so even well before then. So a little bit closer to the contemporary time frame of the Viking Age, um, throughout the migration and Vendel period, there are some artistic iconography that depict people with horns and things on their helmets. Um, mostly comes from little decorative embellishments on helmets uh, found in Olin, Sweden, as well as on the Sutton Hoo grave. Uh, the massively famous, um, beautifully ornamented helmet had these uh, faceplates that depicted um, like berserks and Ulfhednar. Um, you know, spear dancing and things like that, but some of them actually had these larger horn helmets. From the same time period, around the 6th century, there was also a statuette found in Opokra, Sweden, of what is believed to be Odin. Um, and he's depicted holding a spear and wearing horn helmets. Now again, all of this is before the Viking Age, by at least 100-200 years, uh, and well over a thousand. So nothing actually that we have in terms of these concrete evidence suggest that any of it existed during the Viking Age. Um, and all of these examples were really used as ornamentation or for ceremonial purposes. Uh, there was nothing uh, intrinsically uh, militaristic about any of it. I sure wouldn't feel comfortable with those horns on my helmets. <laughs> Me neither. It definitely wouldn't be used in battle or in warfare uh, because it throws the entire balance of the helmet off kilter. Um, it's incredibly unwieldy and if somebody really wanted to, if they got really close, they can grab you by the helmet and either pull it off or gain complete control of your head and therefore body and throw you all around. I can promise you that horns on the helmet will never be popular. No, he doesn't look like a Viking. No. no. Will you be back tomorrow? Of course, even though I have my work as a volunteer at the animal shelter to attend to. I'll be here every single day. Good. They really do love you, these children, you know. I'm celebrating the end of the fundraiser that I've organized. Finally, we have enough money to build a proper hospital for these poor children. So in the series, uh, there is a scene that we see um, that leans very, very heavily on uh, cultural differences between the Christians and the Vikings. Uh, basically what we're looking at is uh, priests and nuns that are collecting money to build a hospital for sick children. Um, and they're taking care of these kids and they're very holy and it's all love and light. And here come our Vikings. Um, 
storming onto the shores to kill everybody and eat their lunch. Not only were our enemies unarmed, but they also gathered all the treasures for us in the chests and made food and set the table. Now the show leans heavily on this perception uh, in regards to Christians versus Vikings, and this perception was actually um, the way that people used to see Vikings before uh, TV shows like the Vikings and Norsemen and The Last Kingdom. Um, there's a bunch of others um, that had come out and people started actually questioning who these people were and what their culture was all about. So a lot of the perception that people get about Vikings starting off before they start learning about their culture actually comes down to us from written accounts by monks who are frequently the targets of the Viking raids. And generally speaking, if your only experience with the Vikings was for them to come into your village, burn it down, raid uh, everything that they could and take slaves, you probably wouldn't write too well about them either. Um, so the accounts that we do have don't really paint them in the greatest of lights. Now an important note here is that back in those days, especially during the beginning of the Viking Age, there was a lot of religious conflict that was going on and even throughout the Viking Ages um, there was a lot of uh, conflict that was happening between heathenry and Christianity. So we know of Vikings as raiders because of the accounts that were written down about them, but it's also important to note here that the Christians weren't exactly clean themselves either. There was a lot of the same behavior that was going on in the Christian lands as there was in heathen lands. Um, it was mainly a struggle between religions. In fact, the attack on Lunasfarn that we talk about a lot as the official start of the Viking Age uh, happened on a Christian monastery. Um, by Viking raiders. Uh, it was a lightning raid. Eleven years prior to that, in 782, there was a massacre that happened ever done that was committed by Charlemagne. He had taken 4,500 Saxons hostage because they kept returning back to their pagan beliefs and he wanted them to be Christianized. So what he did was he forcefully baptized them in the river and then proceeded to behead them in front of their families. Now, word spreads, and there is a belief, and it's a theory, but there is a belief that the attack on Lindisfarne that happened 11 years after was the retribution for what happened at Verdun. Everyone here knows that I am next in line. And if you have a problem with that, then we have something called the Blood Eagle. A Blood Eagle? is a Viking torture method where you have somebody tied down and you cut open their back, pull open their ribs, then pull out their lungs and sprinkle salt water on their lungs to cause them to convulse and, f and flex as if they're two large bloody wings flapping. It's also been attested to being a sacrifice to Odin. So this depiction is disgusting and terrifying, but it's also incredibly vivid and imaginative um, and has influenced people from back then uh, up until now, where you see it being portrayed in TV shows. Now the Eagles are very fashionable these days. And in metal music. And it's inaccurate. No! There's two written accounts that portray the Blood Eagle specifically. There's one in the Orkning saga, where a man named Einar kills a nobleman Halfdang uh, by Blood Eagle, and basically makes the sacrifice of him to Odin. And there's another depiction in the saga of Ragnar's children, where Ivar the Boneless actually captures Ayla, the king of Northumbria, and kills him via Blood Eagle. This is widely speculative, and it's a hugely debated topic, um, but the wide consensus is that the torture method of the Blood Eagle did not exist. It's widely believed that the vivid description of the Blood Eagle um, kind of serves the same purpose of just an exaggerated martyrdom. So in the same strain as the tale of the killing of St. Sebastian, uh, where he was so shot full of arrows that his internal organs were exposed, um, it, that style of uh, martyrdom exaggeration leads further and further towards uh, the misrepresentation of the actual text or the actual events. So there's an American philologist, Roberta Frank, who basically likens the vivid descriptions of the Blood Eagle to the original authors of the saga um, 
misunderstanding the alliterative kennings used in uh, skaldic verse. If you look at the literal skaldic verse, um, the original text, uh, the descriptions of the blood eagle are basically boiled down to um, uh, a blood eagle was carved on their back um, or something of the sort. And what she alludes this to is uh, a kenning for uh, when the bodies of the battle slain get picked apart by carrion birds and other creatures that lurk the battlegrounds, basically. It's essentially to say that the person died and was then devoured by eagles and ravens and the things of the sort. So it's not this literal torture method so much as they were killed and fell on the battlefield and were eaten, basically. But through this misinterpretation or misunderstanding of that style of kenning for later periods when they was all written down. They basically took the description and mirrored it against other depictions of deaths and martyrdoms to make it more engaging and imaginative and terrifying uh, to the point that you're going to remember it. And what better way to tell a tale than in a way you're going to remember. Thank you so much for watching guys, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you can be notified of our future videos, and we'll see you in the next one. I don't know if that's sexy or not. <laughs> the success is wafting you away. <laughs> Just smell it. Just smell the success wafting in your face. <laughs> What's it smell like? Ranch. <laughs>